Hello. Hi, is this John? Hey, it is. It's John. Our- Holy moly, we made it. We made it happen. <laughs> we made it. All right, let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is a director, an actor, a writer, a producer. And someone we first met over 20 years ago. We're very excited to welcome Mr. John Asher to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, John. Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm an old man now. <laughs> man, time has passed. I, I can't believe it. It's a pleasure and an honor to say Happy Father's Day, John. Oh, my gosh. I am so blown away by that. I, I Back then, I wouldn't have thought. Yeah. My son had already graduated high school this year, which was unbelievable. And I'm so proud of him and honored to be his dad because he's literally the nicest kid in the world. Yeah. Good looking boy, too, just like his dad. Oh, you're very sweet. You're very <laughs> sweet. <laughs> no, it, it's true, though. I mean, we met like 20 years ago, and to know that you've got a, a son that's going kind of out on the world on his own, it, it made me feel so old. Well, don't feel old. You sound fantastic. Um, <laughs> now, and then I'm headed to Hawaii tomorrow to uh, direct a cucumber commercial. Cue the joke. But it's <laughs> a true story. Wow. Uh, a cucumber I'm leaving my business partner's house right now. Thank you, Lee, for everything. Talk to you soon. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> All right. Now, I've got to know. Wait, that wait, wait. A cucumber commercial? I didn't know that veg- vegetables needed. Wait. Okay, so this could go one of two ways. Is this for the health nuts, or is this for the very lonely women? Uh, oh, interesting. Uh, both, both, probably, <laughs> I would say. Wow, so now that Tiffany's brought the class of the show down a few uh, levels... It's, it's yeah, crazy. no, I think, I, think all, I think all cucumbers need advertising. Yeah, yeah. I think they do it. Well, I know avocados get advertising. I didn't know cucumbers. I, I mean, it, it's interesting. Now, here you are 20-some years later. And I, I think you started to dabble in directing when we first met you. But you, you've done great movies and work with legendary people. And, and yet you're still kind of branching out. You're doing music videos. You're doing commercials. Are, are, do you feel like you're still learning? Or is it just something to do something different? Or I don't... Well, I think that like life everything is always evolving you know so nothing no no joke back in the 80s works as well as it would work today do you know what i mean like it doesn't have some things just don't last so we're always we are always evolving and i feel like you constantly are learning as a filmmaker i mean going from you know my first film was shot on 35 millimeter film and now i shoot probably everything exclusively on the alexa or the red which is digital Mm -hmm. um but, yeah, I think I'm always learning to answer your question, but I also, I really love it that much. I love storytelling, and I, I love imagery and, and the whole process of filmmaking. I like every single step of it. I mean, none of it I don't like. Well, you had a, a great background and a mentor that we both love, the great William Asher, and he was so nice to us. We spent like six hours at his home in Palm Springs. And I'll tell you right yeah. out, he did nothing but talk about you. He was so proud of you, John. Oh, he's so sweet. He's so sweet. I miss him. I really miss him a lot. He, uh, God, he, he, he came into my life at the perfect time. My mom was a single mom with three kids. Mm-hmm. And uh, my biological father uh, wasn't the greatest dad he just he had his own demons he was dealing with right. and william asher came in and just stole my heart and when i turned 18 on my 18th birthday he came in and he said what do you think if i adopt you and i was like that would be awesome <laughs> so the following week the following week we went to the courthouse and we walk into the courthouse and here i am an adult now yeah. and all these parents with their little babies sitting there waiting to adopt and here i come in with my dad and the judge said well i guess i can ask you do you want uh, do you want william to be your dad i said i do and he hit the gavel down he said it's official and then we went to um oh my god we went to i gotta remember the name of the restaurant oh my god in hollywood super famous restaurant where did we go um i, I keep wanting to say sardi's that's new york 
we went to Musso Frank's. Oh, okay, yeah, in Hollywood, famous, yeah. And we, and we, and we, and we, uh, we celebrated there. And I can't be more grateful for him. And and I know this is a bit of a run on, run on sentence, but you know his daughter. I mean, there's there's eight of us, but there's two of us that went into the business. And his daughter Rebecca Asher, uh, right now, is probably one of the most successful television directors out there, male or female. Uh, she's just crushing it right now. I'm so proud of her. Now I gotta find out because. One thing with, with Hollywood Kids, as we talk about, I even brought up Hollywood Kids 20 years ago when we were talking to Universal Hilton, is when they have a legendary parent that, that does what they're doing now, it, it kind of drives them and, and they, they there's a bit of a competition, but you know, being mentored by and knowing they have that legacy to fulfill, does that help or does that hurt you? To know that people are going to judge you and knowing that you came from this legendary family. I mean, of course, you've established yourself on your own and did great things and actor and, and directing, but what about knowing that in the background, I mean, he was such a legendary director. I mean, how does that affect you in living up to it? Uh, you know, I think when I was younger, I felt that energy you're talking about of oh my god I've got to fill my father's shoes but yeah. it was such a different time back then um, I don't I don't think I ever will or want to I think what he did is a standalone situation mm -hmm. um, and I think that I can just practice the things that he taught me which was your crew comes first and I really hold that near and dear to my heart which is I know every single crew member's name and if you treat your crew like gold, they're going to bend over backwards to, to make you have a great, great movie. And yeah. you can't make a movie. I mean, I've, I've met directors out there that, you know, they, all they care about is the, you know, their story. And they're not thinking about all the people it takes to make this story. So mm -hmm. that I will carry on. And I believe I'm filling that, that part of the prophecy. If I am clever enough to write something that's brilliant that one day gets me an Oscar. I mean, I always think about the Oscar, and I'm going to put it out there in the universe. I do think about it, and I would love to hold one in my hand one day and look down and see my name engraved on there. I think it'll happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was yeah. just excited to hold your dad's Emmy. I mean, I got to hold it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, you saw there were two there. Yeah. Uh, you may not know this, but I think he had six total. Uh, four of which were thrown in the water yeah. because of a, a fight he got in with an ex-wife. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's true with the story. Was. But those are very rare. Very rare. Yeah. Now, let me ask, uh, because when you started out, of course, you're directing and stuff now, but when you started out, you started out as an actor. Uh, what did I, It's kind of interesting, because your mom, Joyce, was is an actress. Your, your dad was a director. Um, growing up, did you always want to be a director, and kind of acting was just what you did in the meantime? Or what was the path to get where you are now? Um, I My mom got me involved in acting when I was a kid, and I was really focused on becoming a professional surfer, if you want to know the truth. Um, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to be in the PSAA, is what it was called at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, when I didn't qualify and I realized, you know, you can make $5,000 doing a carpet commercial, I was like, dude, uh, <laughs> all right. So, so I started focusing on the acting uh, pretty heavily. Um, and while it was only when I, when I, when, while I was acting uh, that I realized directing was something that was even, could even be a possibility for me. And I just really started focusing and paying attention everything that was going on behind the scenes and I broke so many of my dad's cameras he would always bring home the latest you know new VCR <laughs> camcorder yeah. and I would say wouldn't it be cool if we could film the guy jumping from roof to roof and then I would try and make the jump and then I was like I can't do it so I would throw the camera <laughs> and then of course it would crash and break into a million pieces the shot was great though the shot looked cool wow. um, but I, I think then during Weird Science is when that transition happened and Believe it or not, Universal, I went to them uh, at the time, I believe it was Sid, Sid Scheinberg, was he still there? I'm not, I'm not sure who was running the studio at the time, but I remember talking to one of the heads of the studio, and I said, I want to make a short film, and they said, we'll finance it for you, which is incredible. 
incredible. Yeah. So they gave me all the trucks and the lights, and I just paid for the crew, really, and uh, I shot a short film. And then that short film got me my first feature. Wow. Well, didn't you That's start? Uh, didn't you start directing some episodes of Weird Science, or was is it after you started directing? I I, I asked, and uh, basically all I got was Snickers. They were <laughs> like, "This guy will never be." As a, as a matter of fact, um, we were renegotiating our contracts at one time, and my manager told me to play hardball. He said they can't make the show without you, so just tell them you're not going to show up. Yeah. Right. I was like, "Oh my god!" So. So I tried to play hardball, and they wrote an episode where Gary Wallace died. Oh! And they were at, oh yeah, oh yeah, Gary Wallace goes to Hollywood to become a director, and I'm putting my hands in quotes, and right when he says action from behind, he gets hit by a wrecking ball. Wow. And then Wyatt goes and finds a new friend. It was not a joke. Oh this my was God. Like a really a written episode. Uh, and I think Michael Manasseri might have that script somewhere. Wow. Um, so I was like, man, so that... Talk about fueling your fire. The fact that these guys really believed that I didn't have what it what it took to, to direct a film really got under my skin. Um, and I went and directed my first film right after that. I mean, right right after that, my very first film. With Hilary Swank was in it, Corbin yeah. Burnson, uh, Bruce Payne. I mean, I had a real legit cast, and I was 21 years old directing these big stars, and I was really excited about it. Well, um, you, you know, it's, it's kind of terrible because they, they knew that you had background. I mean, with, with somebody that's getting into the business, like you got into the business and knowing who your dad, William Masher, was, I mean, you try to make your own career, and you're proud of, of your, you know, elder that was there before you and everything, but you try to do your own thing and everything. I don't know if you knew this or not, but I have all the original press material for Weird Science. They were totally bringing it to the intention of everyone that William Asher was your dad. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, and it was even suckier when I the guys that wrote that script, uh, the one where I get hit with the wrecking ball, Yeah, they, uh, uh, I went off during our summer break and I directed Counterfeit and they heard about it, they saw it, and then one of them got an opportunity to, to direct a big episode. And it was his first time directing, and he was he was very, very nice guy, but the part that he just, uh, that I couldn't grasp is that he was coming to me asking about stage direction. He's like, yeah. John, what do I do here? And I was like, unreal, that you're asking me right now. And I was like, okay, so, but I helped him. Um, but I think, at the time, um, they were maybe worried about other cast members saying, hey, you know, he's directing, why aren't I directing? So that could be part of it. I don't know. But I think it all worked out for the best. Well, I'm, I was uh, I'm okay with it. told by Michael Manasseri that Anthony Michael Hall showed up on the set a few times. Maybe they were thinking if they had a problem with you, they could bring him in, <laughs> which would have been terrible. Oh. Yeah. Uh, no, he showed up. He showed up to... He said, maybe I can play your older brother. Yeah. That's what he wanted to do. He was, he was pitching that idea to them. And for whatever reason, they didn't do it. I thought that would have been a really fun thing to do. Yeah. And I, I love Michael. He's so, yeah. such a cool guy. You, you know, the thing that was great for me is I loved the USA Network back then. I'm not really fond of whatever they do now, but back then it was fun. And the way they promoted Weird Science, the way it started out, you guys were on USA Up All Night with Rhonda Shearer, right? That's right. Wow, that was fun. <laughs> what was that like for you? Well, there was a lot of cross pollination. You guys did voices on uh, Duckman too. Yep, yep. I remember that. I was just thinking about that the other day, and they did. Yeah, they. I just see myself animated. That was really <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, the Rhonda Shear thing, a hundred percent. My, I mean, I I just remember how young I was, but I was about twenty two or twenty three towards the end of the show and, and Rhonda Shear was there and I was flirting with her as hardcore as I could. <laughs> I was like, oh, what are you doing? Like, I, I just remember that being, she was the apex. I was just like, yeah. whoa, wow. You know? <laughs> and Vanessa Angel was untouchable. So believe me, I, I, I still to this day think Vanessa Angel is so beautiful and so sweet and so kind. Um, but at some point, I think it transitioned from Googly eyes to okay, this is my big sister. You know yeah. what I mean? 
right. um, which was great. You and weren't the only one. Michael Manasseri and, and Lee Turgeson, yeah, all three of you had the hots for uh, Vanessa Angel. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how you can. <laughs> and, 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 and it's day in, day out. By the way, going to work was an absolute pleasure. Yeah. I had no problem. I was like, yay, going to work again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Good thing. Well, yeah, I can just imagine. Like, I know you were at Vanessa's uh, wedding, and when they come to the part of, I does, was. does anybody object? If I was you, I'd have been well. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I, I I definitely thought about it. I definitely thought about it for yeah. sure. Now, uh, we're, yeah, I'm getting but, I'm getting prompted by listeners, John, because like a lot of people yes. is wanting to know. A while back. There was a video, I believe it was posted on Vanessa's Facebook page, that it was you, uh -huh. Michael, and Vanessa, and it was a tease about weird science coming back or some kind of project like that. So and you said something is, on a podcast, too. I didn't hear the podcast, but there, there's something going on. Is there a rebirth of weird science? Uh, look, we uh, all have been toying with the idea of it and trying to figure out how to get it off the ground, figuring out who has the rights. I can give you the general idea of what it would look like. Um, it's basically we're back at Farber High, and we come down and we find um, Emily and I think her name, I forgot, uh, it's like Emily and Melissa. And they're two total nerd out girls, and they're about to go to high school for the first time, and those end up being Wyatt and Gary's daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, and they uh, come home after a miserable day at school, and they go into Dad's garage, and they find El Diablo, the old computer, and they release Lisa. Mm. And they, yeah, they discover Lisa, and then they turn her into a gorgeous twenty-three-year-old hot guy. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. So yeah, so everything flip-flopped, and Gary, uh, you know, you were like, "Whoa, Gary has a daughter." No, he actually adopted her because nobody would marry him. Uh, but, but <laughs> the last time we saw Gary, well, he, he was last time we saw Gary, he was with an alien. Well, ship. I was going to ask that because there was some episodes of Weird Science that you guys filmed that I don't think USA ever aired. So, but it, like the very uh, last episode, didn't Gary go off with an alien? I did, I did, but everybody must remember that Lisa's magic does not last forever. So yeah, that's, true. that's the big thing. To think about. <laughs> Her, her magic never lasts. But I uh, that was the original pitch. And there was a couple of, we pitched it to Awesome TV. And then they said they were into it, but they were into it without us. Yeah. <laughs> so we were like, wait a second. Um, I was like, that doesn't make any sense. No. Uh, so there's definitely, we're kicking the tires. We would like to do it. And then Michael wrote kind of a like a fan film pilot-ish type thing for us to shoot this summer and I don't know if we're going to shoot it I don't want to give that away but that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of something that could potentially happen and then we would use that to sell to do the show um, I, I'm not opposed to doing it I think it would be super fun I started pitching that about five years ago so you see how long it takes things right. to, you know, into action I mean I don't know the ins and outs of the business but I'll tell you a perfect place because they've already done this uh with Punky Brewster, and that's Peacock, and Peacock is owned by the people that own Universal, so it would be so. We perfect. are, yeah. we we are, yeah, yeah. We've already talked to Peacock. We've, oh, okay, we've, we've uh, yeah, yeah. We've talked to them. We've we've definitely been talking to people. I mean, it would be really fun to do, and I like that. You know, and of course, whenever Lisa is around us, she turns into Lisa, and whenever she's she he is around the boy about the girls she turns into larry so it's larry and lisa is one and the same person which is kind of cool and very now you know mm -hmm. what i mean because right. it's like she's a yeah. genie she could be whatever the hell she wants to be which is awesome right you know uh i think it could be a lot of fun and i like that these two girls are nerds and we get to really go on their adventures and we get to be the parents and yeah. it's simple and i would i would direct the pilot and then uh michael wants to direct episodes so that'd be cool yeah, Michael's directing now, too, right? I mean, Michael's a filmmaker as well. Yep. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, he is. He's a producer. He's a successful producer and filmmaker. Yeah, he's doing great. Well, I know this would make Vanessa happy. We had Vanessa on, and 
she's still pining and she's still in mourning because she loved doing weird science so much and all she talked about was oh it was done at universal studios and it was big time and and she's not as happy with things she's done you know after weird science is doing weird science she loved it so much mm. yeah i mean you know it's hard that was such a it's one of those things it's kind of lightning in a bottle for us you know from the crew to the writer's room and the directors we had. I mean, we got really lucky and we got to do ridiculous stuff at a perfect time in life. I mean, the 90s was such a trippy time for everybody. Um, so I don't know. I, I think we got really lucky. I always like, you know, like the, the video I just directed with uh, Todrick Hall, mm -hmm. uh, It's Raining Fellas is out of control and so fun so i like that there's always new things happening right you know i mean it, to me it's like you just never stop um and i think you know vanessa is a really good at photography and i was telling her i was like maybe you should start thinking about lighting maybe you want to be a cinematographer like life is always evolving you know yeah. who knows she definitely has an eye for it because she was complaining about the way they shot her and some of the stuff she did later about the lighting and stuff. So she definitely has an eye for that. You guys are all very artistic. I mean, you're you're as much behind the camera as you are in front, and and that really helps out. It really does. Yeah, you know, I got to tell you this story it was so crazy. People think that we were nuts. We used to take the Universal tour, and halfway in, we're in the tram, and we're going in this desolate area where they were storing big props and stuff. And all of a sudden, we stand up and we start screaming, and and we demand that they stop the tram. And everybody thought we were crazy. And there, off in the field, was the weird science pirate ship. <laughs> oh yeah, they used to. Yeah, yep. That thing was parked, I think, before one of the cave entrances. I think. Yeah. But I remember the pirate ship. Yeah. Yeah, that we was, couldn't uh, do that. that a... We couldn't do that nowadays. We'd get arrested if we <laughs> screamed at them to stop the tram. <laughs> but I, I gotta ask you, yeah. now, now doing that, I know you're doing music videos now, they want to talk about your music videos, but but that whole thing had to be a blast doing that whole musical thing and it went so well, I mean, that was that fun for you or? Which one, the pirate episode or the one I just shot? The pirate episode, then we'll talk about what you're doing now with the music. So. Oh, oh, sure, sure, yeah, no, I mean, that was insane. I was, Michael was really such, he, you know, he's a classically trained actor and I'm a Malibu surfer turned actor and <laughs> you know director I, I think that Michael I mean he was singing for re legit on yeah. that ship that was real uh, you know I think Michael if I'm not mistaken Michael did uh, The King and I with Yul Brenner on really? Broadway so wow. yeah so he's a Michael's like a real classically trained actor and I just I feel like I mean, I love being in front of the camera, but I feel like I'm so goofy looking now. I feel like I'm just an exact, I'm like an old Gary Wallace. It's so weird. <laughs> uh, that, but that's, that's why I like, I really love directing. I love storytelling. I, I, like I said, it, it just, it, it feeds every part of my soul. Like it's so rewarding to me. And I think mainly, you know what I love is watching people's reaction videos. Have you seen these things where people on YouTube like, They'll play the video that you directed, right? Yeah. Or well, that I directed, and then they do a reaction video to it. I'm like, oh my god, it's the most fulfilling thing ever. That's great. Oh. <laughs> well, I know that it yeah. was. I oh. know that the this film was a few years ago, but I wanted you to talk a little bit about uh, and tell our audience a little bit about the film that you made, A Boy Called Poe. Um, what it's about and and why it was important. Okay. Uh, well. When I uh, was going through a divorce in 2005, uh, my wife at the time uh, was Jenny McCarthy, and we had a child who was diagnosed with autism. And it was, I don't know if you guys know this, but like 85% of marriages uh, that have children with autism end in divorce. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this until... Uh, recently, actually, it was pretty wild, staggering numbers. Um, and, and your son and had it, your son had it because in. you had it too, right? I mean, you, William Asher was telling me about uh, your challenges with autism yourself. Um, I'm not autistic. I think that I, I mean, I know that I have dyslexia, and that might have been what he was talking oh, okay. about. Okay, you're right. You're uh, right. Sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Um, but 
Yeah. So so anyways, my, my son was diagnosed, super high functioning, but but definitely autism, and he had a seizure, and it was very scary. Mm. And I was going through a divorce, and I was moving in with roommates again. You know, after being married for uh, ten years, yeah. right. and my new roommate was a producer. His name was Darby Parker, and he gave me a script. Uh, a boy called Poe, and it was about a single father raising a child with autism by himself. And I read it, and I was crying, and it took me nine years to get that movie financed, and I rewrote some of it, uh, but Colin Goldman did the bulk of the writing, and um, it was, to me, my love letter to autism, and it wasn't really, it wasn't made for families that are dealing with autism. It was made for people that don't understand autism so yeah. that they can see what a typical family goes through um, and these challenges. But to me, it was a really important movie to make. And, you know, I ended up getting Burt Baccarat to score that movie. Wow. And that story's crazy. He and I flying on a plane from New York. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> and he was this old guy sitting next to me talking about his band and how they travel. And I'm like, this guy's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, he like, said, what, what's he done? Yeah. You know? and he, I had no idea who he was. And then he said, um, he said, what do you do? And I was like, finally, I got a chance to talk. I'm like, I'm a director. Uh, and I am, I'm currently making a movie uh, about autism. And he's like, my daughter had autism. And I was like, what? And he said, yeah, but she killed herself, mm. and, which was just so heartbreaking when he told me. And we immediately had this common bond. And he said, listen. Uh, maybe my band, you know, we could we could give you some music for your movie. And I, again, I'm thinking, oh God, this guy's really pitching his band. I was like, all right. So he writes his name down on a napkin, which was so weird because he didn't have a cell phone. And I am dyslexic, so I can't read back or I, I have no idea what it says. So I get in the car on the way home from the airport. I call my mom. I'm like, mom, some guy. And she's like, spell his name for me. So I spell it, and she was like, oh, John, you're pulling my leg. And I was like, oh, what is And she was like, sweetheart, it's Burt Baccarat. Go listen yeah. to any song. You're going to hear him. And I was like, what? Raindrops keep falling on my head. Mm. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. I mean, God, it was just like the list was endless. I couldn't believe how grac gracious he was. Wow. And he gave me the opening song, and... I'm going to tell you what he... Oh, I can't tell you. I guess I'm bound by that. But I can just tell you, he gave me the opening song, and then he watched the movie, and he said, you have to let me score the movie, the mm. entire film. Oh. I was like, okay. <laughs> and he scored the whole movie. So wow. wow. That's it. That's the story of that. Well, it, it was great because you guys had that bond because of both your personal experiences with with relatives that, that had it. That's, that's incredible. Wow. I, I know you... Yeah, I think the community... Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go about the community. I was just saying that the, uh, almost everybody involved with the film had or was impacted by autism. Yeah. You know, Chris Gorm, who played the father, his son had autism, has autism, sorry. Um, Andrew Bowen, his son has autism. Yeah. Um, everybody was touched by it in some way. Of course, the writer, you know, this is the writer's true story, um, which is incredible. Uh, the only thing we changed that I changed was... Um, was uh, the dream sequences when we go into the boy's mind um, it was originally him with an elephant and he would be having these conversations with an elephant mm -hmm. and we couldn't afford an elephant and all of the work that that would have took so I rewrote in the, 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 the astronaut and the pirate and um, the, the knight and that was all played by Andrew Bowen who did an amazing job well, let me ask you, what about your son? Did he see the film? What did he think about it? And, and knowing that he experiences that firsthand. Wait, say that again? Sorry, it broke up. Oh, okay. What, what did your son think of the film? I mean, did, did he have a chance to see it? And knowing that he uh, is, is, you know, dealing with it, I mean, what did it say to him? How, how was it impressed on him? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I wanted him to see it, and he did see it, and he thought it was okay. He was like, yeah, it's good. You know, it's nice. And I said, do you know what's going on with Poe? And he said, yeah, he has autism. I said, you know you have autism. And he said, not anymore. So <laughs> the thing with Evan is he is now, you know, just recently graduated high school. If he were to take a test for autism, he probably wouldn't test on the autistic spectrum. On the autistic spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of his friends do. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, he, I think the beautiful thing about autism 
that I've learned from Evan, I've learned so much from my son, is that ignorance is bliss. And I don't mean to say that he's ignorant, because that's not what it is. He's not ignorant. He's just not, he's not bound by the rules that, that humanity has set forth. Right. So... He doesn't. He doesn't have a label for things. You know what I mean? Like everything just feels good and happy. And his, you know, his favorite movie of his dad's is Took Him. He, you know, I made a spoof <laughs> on the Taken franchise. Yes, yeah. yeah. And he he quotes that and watches that all the time with his friends. You know, who would have thought? You know. Yeah. Well, what I wanted to ask you before is we were talking about working with uh, Burt Backrack. You've been lucky in the fact that you got to work with a lot of legendary people in your career. Now, I want you to comment on, unfortunately, it wasn't that long ago, we lost the great Kirk Douglas. You did a movie with Kirk Douglas called Diamonds. What was that like working with this big legendary guy? Um, that, that film was crazy. It was originally called Sundowning, and it was about the, what happens when people have Alzheimer's that they start, as the, as the sun sets, they start to really lose their memory even more. Yeah. Uh, it's a real phenomenon that happens. Um, but when we were talking to uh, Kurt's agent at CAA, uh, he said Kurt wants to to do it, but he wants to make it about the stroke. So we, we rewrote the entire script and made it about the stroke. Um, and then we got Dan Aykroyd on board. Uh, and I started getting very nervous. <laughs> I was like, "Oh my god!" Uh, it was my it was my third film, and uh, I met with Mr. Douglas, and I sat and I talked to him, and he said, "You know, uh, I have a friend, uh, Lauren, who would be great as the madam." And I was like, "Cool, Lauren who?" And he's like, "Lauren Bacall." And I was uh-huh. like, oh, "What oh the god. hell is going yeah. on right now?" Yeah. I was like, "This is insane." Um, so I was definitely kind of floating above my body at all times. And that's when I first bought a book on panic attacks, actually, because <laughs> I needed to understand what was going on yeah. in my body. Why was, why was I freaking out? Um, but the very first day on set, we were doing the scene where they're crossing uh, from Canada into the United States at a border crossing. And actually, I put Lee Turgeson in that scene. Mm-hmm. He played the border crossing guard. And... Uh, I told Kurt, I said, you'll get out of the car, you'll walk around here, you'll put your hands on the hood, and then he'll start to frisk you. And the whole crew's listening, and then Kurt turns to me and he says, yes, sir, this is your set. And that was the very, wow. he set the tone for the whole movie. He made mm. sure that everybody knew that it was uh, that it was my vision that I was trying to bring forward. And I think that's important, you know, like, I've noticed in a lot of the films that I've made, um, Sometimes I get hampered by other people's opinions or ideas yeah. rather than rather than just really sticking to my guns and really uh, pushing my vision forward. I feel like that's when you get the most cohesive pieces of work. Yeah. Um, and that's why I really like Pose so much because that is singularly my movie. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't think I'll ever let anybody edit my movies again. Um, it's not because I don't trust editors. But, but, but I, while I'm shooting, I shoot very, very fast. And while I'm shooting, I know exactly what I'm going to cut and how I'm going to cut it. Right. And I feel like when I'm sitting in the edit bay and the, the editor's taking it a different way, I want to lean over and grab the mouse and be like, no, 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 go yeah. over here. And, you know, it just, I think it really has to be uh, my stuff from right. now on. Right. Well, you know, you spoke about collaborating with a legendary actor like that and how he made, you know, you feel comfortable knowing that, that you're the boss and everything. What about director to director when you collaborated with John Landis? Oh, uh, that was cool. You know, I've always been a, a fan of John's stuff. I mean, Animal House and, and, and Blues Brothers, uh, you know, everything. He was my executive producer on Weird Science. Yeah. Um, and I remember him coming to set. This i got to tell you this story. will blow your mind. Absolutely. So, I had the greatest compliment ever in my lifetime, ever in my lifetime, ever. I just can't, I, I can't wait to one day direct him and tell him the story. And he'll be like, what? Um, but John Landis was directing uh, Beverly Hills Cop 3 or 4, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were shooting on the Universal lot. So he came by our set. We were shooting at night. And he said, do you want to come to the set? And I was like, are you kidding? Yes, yeah, of course I want to come to the set. So I get in the cart and we go to the set and it's the, 
uh, it's the amusement park scene. And they've got, it's the first time I've ever seen eight cameras rolling at the same time. I was like, what in the hell? This is amazing. And they were going to do some kind of shootout thing. And I was like, this is incredible. Now, what you don't know is that uh, at the time on the Universal lot, anything that was on a soundstage was uh, piped into a system called Big Brother, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it went to the Black Tower there. And any at any time, uh, the executives that run Universal Studios could turn on their television and see what was going on on any given soundstage. And they could actually see the production. They could see us, you know, in between takes, talking or whatever, but they would see what was what the camera was seeing, right? Mm -hmm. And this was beamed into people's dressing rooms and trailers and all over the place. So anyways, I get in the, the cart, I go with Landis to the soundstage, and I'm waiting there, and all of a sudden, the, the biggest bodyguards you've ever seen in your life these guys had to have been seven feet tall 400 pounds they were oh, big dudes and they're like make a hole make a hole eddie's coming through make a hole get out of the way back up and i was like i was like holy shit oh my god oh my god so i like i like back up and i can barely see over this guy's forearm you know it's so big and eddie comes in and i'm like oh my god it's, i look at me i'm on a set i'm, I'm like i'm like starstruck i'm tripping out and then Eddie's walking, he like makes eye contact with me. And then I'm like, oh my God, he's looking at me. And then he like keeps walking. I'm like, all right, cool. Eddie just looked at me. And then all of a sudden Eddie stops and goes, hold on a second. And I was like, what, what's going on? And he's like, you, and he points at me. And I'm like, oh my God, he's wow. gonna kill me. I'm gonna die, wow. he's gonna kill me. <laughs> what did I do? And he walks over, uh, am I allowed to swear on this thing? Yes, yeah, yes. yes absolutely. Uh, uh, so he walks over and he goes, I just watched you in my trailer and you are the funniest motherfucker I've ever seen. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was frozen in time. Wow. I was frozen in time. I literally, I'm not even telling you, there is no review that can take me down now. I was like, Eddie Murphy has blessed me with funniness. No it was lie. incredible. It was literally the most insane thing. Wow. Uh, and he happened to catch me. He was in his trailer and he saw the big brother system. Um, yeah. But anyway, so Landis, taking you guys full circle. Yeah. Uh, so years later, I'm directing a movie called I Hate Kids. Right. And we we, we uh, worked with John Landis. He was our executive producer, and he was awesome. Uh, he had a lot of great ideas, and he didn't really bother me on set at all. You really? know, he just, I did my, no, not at all. Hmm. I did my thing um, where he was most helpful was in editorial, where he came in and watched my cut, and he's like, I really like it. I think you did a great, this is a fun movie, and I said, thank you. And then he gave me some suggestions, which of course, I took them and I put them into the movie, and um, some of them were timing things. He's really, really incredible with timing. Mm -hmm. And um, and the guy is just a, a source of jokes. He literally, like, you cannot, you, you meet him or talk to him, uh, he just cannot stop telling jokes. He's incredible. Oh, he's he's got a so funny many guy. Jokes. I know I, I read, yeah. and how can this... Now, I don't know, like, the technical aspects. You did the whole thing in one cut? How, how could no, that wait, be? No, that was a different film. Oh, that was a different Before film. we move on to that, I wanted to ask for with I Hate Kids, because that has uh, Joyce, that has your mom in it. Yeah. Do you make your mom audition, John? No. Well, <laughs> I, you know what's funny? I made... I, 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 didn't, I didn't make her, but... Um, I did not make her, but I... Uh, the producers made her on Tooken because they didn't believe she could do an Irish accent, which blew my mind. Oh my I was gosh. like, guys, my mom can do anything, but all right. So that was that. Yeah. The, now, they made, they, to, to talk about uh, the, the one cut, the one cut film, that was Somebody Marry Me. We actually right. just rewatched that. We like, watched it both the same night. Ago. That's where I got confused. But yeah, and one cut. How, first of all, how did you get the idea to try to do this in one cut? And how did you actually even achieve that? I mean, it's insane to me to even fathom that. I mean, how can that happen? How do you do that? Well, look, honestly, some of it is sheer willpower to just make a mission statement and be like all right we're gonna do this and i it really stems from having to pay my rent that's how that film was <laughs> uh, i'm not even kidding uh it's a uh, necessity you know necessity is the uh what is it the mother of invention right yeah. um it's like i originally was attached to direct a movie that todd sherry was supposedly producing i think that they weren't being honest with me about that 
So, uh, anyways, the movie fell apart. And I turned to them and I said, well, well, how much money do you guys have? And they said, we have $300,000. So I was like, $300,000? What the hell? So on the spot, and I, I'm not kidding you, I had to pay my rent. I said, what if there was a way we could make a movie in one take? <laughs> and I'm not kidding you, I pitched that movie on the fly. That movie didn't exist. I pitched it in the room, on the fly, and Lamar Billups wrote a check right there. She said, how much do you think it'll cost? And I said, we'd probably do it for 200000 She wrote a check on the spot. She said, I need the script. I said, yeah, 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 no problem. I got to go home. I, 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 no problem. Yeah, 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 I'll go. And I went home, and luckily, I was flying to Chicago to see my son. And I called them. I'm like, I'll, I'll send it when I, right when I land in Chicago. I was in Chicago for one week. I wrote that film in one week, wow. record time. Wow. I brought it in. She was like, done deal. And then, the, and the way that I wrote it, like you, the, I wrote the movie to be shot in one take. I mean, that's really what it was. And then I was like, uh-oh, I got to find actors that can actually do this. Right. Um, so I, most of those actors are stage actors, people that do plays, you know, that really understand that. And uh, Ray Abruzzo, an incredible actor, uh, was the head of that cast. And we rehearsed on a stage, a proper theater stage, for one week. And I would come in towards the end of rehearsals and, like, throw chairs on the ground and set off alarms and do crazy stuff to make sure that they would just stay in it, no matter what happened, because I knew we were going into a real-world environment. Mm -hmm. So what you were, so then we went uh, to the location of the, of the house, and the main house, I had to find another house with, you know, that would allow us to film. By the way, it's hard to get people to say yes, by the way, when you're filming in their house. I need to film your house, not the exterior. I need to go into your house. I also need to come out, and I need to use your neighbor's house directly next door. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> all of this. The biggest department in the film ended up being the sound department, funny enough. The camera department was the smallest because the camera was handheld by my cinematographer, Graham Fortes, who was fantastic. But, yeah. but the biggest department was sound. Everybody was on wireless, and I had five, I had five separate mixers. Oh. So the, the actors would walk in and out of the frequencies, and we would pick them up. Oh. Um, but we shot that. We rehearsed for one day, all the blocking, all the camera movement. Then the next day we shot, and I thought in my head, I was like, I'll probably get it two or three times. So I'll have some choices. There's only one take in existence, and it's the one you see. Oh, wow. Because, That's incredible. Yeah. We, we shot it three times, and then on the fourth take, we made it 75 minutes into it, and the camera turned off. We don't know why. It just stopped. Um, and then we went to lunch, and it started to drizzle outside. And I said to the producers, I said, can we come back tomorrow? And they said, we don't have the money. You got to get it today. And I was like, okay. So everybody, we got one more shot at this after lunch. Just relax. We've had some good rehearsals today. I called action. And then 97 minutes later, I called cut. And that was it. That's what, what you see is, that's it. Well, um, I have incredible. To, it's incredible. I, I have to say that I, that I was thoroughly impressed because the thing is, is that you have to have actors who can carry it on and even fill in space or improv if they have to do i am i was i correct in reading that there was even times when you guys were stuck in traffic i mean if you're doing a live take and you're not cutting what do you do then there's two moments in the film only two that are improv um and so basically uh like for example like the bagel truck i we kind of moved like a snake. So it was me, the first AD, uh, the key grip, and the camera operator. So there were four of us that kind of moved like a snake. And, you know, I'm in the back of that bagel truck. So and I have a clamshell monitor. I'm watching everything happen. So I'm able to call out to the actors, audibles, if need be. Um, the one spot that was improv in the beginning was when he's with the Russian girl, he went into the to the kitchen to get her a glass of wine, mm -hmm. and the first AD tapped me and said his lavalier fell off his chest. You got to go retape it on. Mm. So I run around the house. I go in there. I retape his microphone, 
put a pull his shirt back down and then send him back out. Mm. So that's that. So he was. That's why he's like, sorry, just taking a few minutes. He was improving there. <laughs> and then the next time, the next time was in the bagel truck on the way back with the hero girl, the one he's finally. You think he's going to marry her? Yeah. Um, I. I. They were just sitting in silence, and I was like. Ray, start talking about uh, dreaming about bagels. And he's like, I have the craziest dreams about bagels. <laughs> and he did that whole thing about bagels. The, the uh, girl in the movie and that, was it. That, that answered the ad that, that was the positive, well, I call her hippie chick, not really a hippie <laughs> chick, but, but, but she was, said he was the guy of her dreams that somebody said she was going to meet somebody with his name. And I fell uh, in love with her so much. <laughs> like, where do you find a girl like that? I mean, that... that Right. She is. I, I, I'm surprised. You know, years later, I go to check IMDb, and I'm like, she should be a massive star by now. Yeah. Like, I don't understand. She's one of those, you know, they fall through the cracks. You know, sometimes there's people out there that are so good that either give up or they're just like, oh, I'm not into it anymore. She was so vulnerable and so talented. Ah, she was great. And, and was it's great. always fun for weird science fans to see some of your cohorts from Weird Science appear in your movies and you got a chance to act with the uh, actor that played your dad in Weird Science. Jeff Desset, yeah. yeah. Uh, I did. He was there He was there as an emergency backup. Um, we were having not difficulty but I would say misunderstandings with um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name right now, Barton Fink. Um, oh my lord. He played the dad. Uh, why am I forgetting his name? Anyways, he he kept saying to me, he kept blowing his lines. And he'd be like, John, I don't understand why you can't just get some coverage. And I was like, sir, you don't understand. <laughs> like, this is one continuous take. Like, yeah. we can't. So then I said, I called Jeff to set, and I said, Jeff, I need you to play the rabbi, but just in case things don't work out, can you please step in and take? So he understudied him, yeah. just in case. So he was there. He he was so uh, funny. We we had like a cute little story. We were at a TV taping, and he had showed up, and and we met him outside, and told him that we were big weird science fans and everything, and he really enjoyed meeting us. And and during the taping, in the middle of the taping, they had to stop for some reason. He made us stand up in the audience because he wanted to introduce his fan to the rest of the audience like he only had one uh, fan, which is crazy. <laughs> like these are my weird science fans. He's such a nice guy. Yeah, he's incredible. I, he always calls me son, too. When yeah. He calls, he's like, son, listen. Um, yeah, he's funny. I love he, all the interaction on, on Facebook between you and, and the people from Weird Science. I love the thing with your mom. Now, your mom, I love her so much. She's been on the show, and she's a great lady. And it's so funny because I don't even know if you're aware of this, but when she was on the show, she was trying to set you up on a date with my daughter, who's the other co-host here. And on Facebook, you were trying to set somebody up with your mom, so you're doing it equally. Is, is that kind of like a family joke or something? Or I, it's never a joke when we're looking for love. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't, I don't consider that a joke at all. Yeah. Well, uh, no, we're just looking. We're looking out for each other. I mean, my mom. Uh, so funny seeing her on Tinder is the craziest thing ever. I really, literally, have to explain to her, like, mom, that. That guy is a serial killer. You need to stay away from him. Like, I think. So, did anything come out of things. did anything come out of people answering uh, you about your mom? Because there was a lot of people. Was like, well, I'm available. Uh, there, yeah, I think there was. Uh, my mom's pretty particular, but uh, yeah, there was. There was for sure. There was one guy in a jazz band that she was kind of into, but she keeps saying, you know, she's like, all these guys care about is sex. She's like, that's <laughs> not. She's like, I want someone I can go to the beach with and enjoy time with. I don't need to know all that business. <laughs> you know, she's very, she calls herself square. I don't, you know, that's an old expression yeah. from the 50s. I don't think she's square. I just think she's adorable. And, yeah. you know, she, I think every, she doesn't like the aggressive nature. You know, she's very, very sweet. She's, I mean, I love my mom more than anything. Right. It's pretty obvious, but yeah. Well, we had all yeah. the weird science moms on. We we had Melanie Chartoff that was uh, Manasseri's mom too, and she's a great lady. No, no. But how how did that yeah. happen that your mom got on Weird Science? I mean, did did they cast her and you didn't know about it? And you were surprised. I heard the old story with 
the Partridge family, uh, David Cassidy wasn't aware that they had cast Shirley Jones, who was a stepmom. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, that's so crazy. Another show that my mom missed out on. Um, her, my mom's story is so crazy. It is so crazy. You know that my mom was cast to play the original Brady mom, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, it's so crazy. Um, I No, I'm the one that suggested it. Oh, I said, okay. who's going to play the mom? And they were like, who? And I was like, my mom. And they were like, is she an actress? I was like, are you guys crazy? Yes, an <laughs> and then um, uh, she went in and read, and then they, they called me, and they said, your mom got the part. And mm. I was like, oh, good. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it made sense. It was so fun working with her, but also, you know, here I am, I'm still a kid, I'm trying to grow up and, yeah, yeah. and act professional, and I wish, you know, it's so fun working with her, I can't even tell you, but I also, I wish I'd enjoyed it a little more back then, you know, you, you think you know it all when you're that age, you think you know everything, but um, that's why I love putting her in movies, I love directing her, she's so, she's so directable, you can, she just, I mean, that's a different level of an actress, she's so talented. And it's probably embarrassing uh, when you're. These, these, what's that? I was saying it's probably embarrassing when you're sitting there talking to a studio head, and your mom comes up and spits on a napkin and wipes something <laughs> off in your face because that's what moms do. That's that's what moms do. Yeah. She uh, she embarrassed me plenty on Diamonds. I had her play a role in Diamonds where she's flirting with Kurt Douglas, <laughs> and uh, we put her in a pretty skimpy outfit, and she came out, and she hiked up her breast, and she said, remember these? Oh, I was like, oh wow. my God. <laughs> yeah. In front of the whole crew. There's literally wow. nothing I could do about it. Just smile. So we, we've seen you like on Facebook with uh, Vanessa and with Michael, but what about Lee Turgis? I know he's been in some of your, your films, but do you hang out with him a lot at all, or...? I wish I hung out with him more. Uh, he took me to my very first Rage Against the Machine concert. Mm. Uh, we had we had an interesting bond. You know, he was again like a big brother to me, um, and I looked up to him. I think Michael and I both looked up to him. Uh, he's a very another one of those actors that's very studied and very pro and doesn't mess around, um, and that's why I put him in took in, but. Uh, he lives in New York, so we don't get to spend that much time together. Yeah. But he's got a beautiful family, and he's a sweet man, and he works really hard. So, well, I, like, I know I, I have a friend in New York. Yeah. I, I really like, and I want to uh, end this by talking about this. Uh, you really are good at the music video stuff, and and the video that I saw, the clip I saw on Facebook, you, you've got the hot chicks laying on the cars and all. Of it. it was just great. I mean, what, what is that like for you? And talk about some of your music videos that you've been doing recently. Uh, I mean, you know, the whole COVID year was, everything was pretty much shut down and tricky to get things off the ground, to say the least. So now that everything's opened up, um, I started a new production company and just making, I've made, uh, in the past month, I made three music videos back to back to back. Wow. Uh, one called Johnny, Johnny Marfa and the Lights, which are two country guys driving in their space truck they wanted to make their truck be a spaceship so i was like okay <laughs> and we their pickup trucks with spaceships and then the next one was for some 41 mm -hmm. uh where my best friend Derek wibley he's the lead singer of that band um they did a moo uh, uh sorry they did a, a music video kind of a hybrid where we used the fans and uh, and him walking alone on the street, and it's to bring attention to teen suicide and suicide in general. Mm -hmm. A pretty heavy video. And then uh, Todrick Hall's team reached out to me uh, to direct a music video for him called "Raining Fellas." And um, boy, did it rain fellas! I've never seen so many naked men in one day in my <laughs> life. I couldn't believe it. Um, but I'll tell you, in, in saying that, uh, it was. You know, well, I, you'd have to watch the video, but it's all done in a very artsy, big Broadway, classy way. Yeah, like, I, have, I know yeah. you see a lot of fun, a lot, yeah. of, a lot of buns, a lot of stuff going on. But there, you know, I think when something is done tastefully, uh, then it's fine. You know, and even the crew guys. I mean, I remember we had a naked guy on top of naked, but face down on a taxi cab in the opening shot, and uh, one of the grips walked by eating a donut. You know, and he's a big Harley-looking guy, and he goes, 
that's a good looking dude. And he kept walking. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. everybody could appreciate a beautiful body no matter what. That's um, right. And I think this song celebrates, it was the perfect time. It, you know, it's Pride Month and everything. So, Podrick Hall is a, he's a real genius. So, it's a lot of fun to work with him. Wow. Well, and then more stuff to come. And I'm writing two movies right now. Fantastic. I'm writing a movie about a woman that is addicted to gambling. And uh, she ends up robbing a bank to pay off her debt. Pretty incredible. Uh, that's called Running Bad. So I'm writing that right now. Uh, and then I'm toying with the idea of writing a movie called The First Time, where it's a, it's another movie about autism, but it's a father-son, and it's a, it's a dad hiring a woman to teach his son what to do on the first time. And oh, okay. the girl that he hires, the girl that he hires ends up falling in love with the son. Ah. It's pretty sweet. No, I, lo- I love those crazy. kind of movies. Yeah. I, I, you know, they remind me, I, yeah. I call them, in fact, I call them USA Up All Night movies because it's kind of like the stuff they showed, and, and I definitely love that. I, I like the fact that you still do a little acting too now and then. We want to see you on the screen. I bet I just did so. I don't know what I just did. I, what was the, <laughs> I did the, the Rizzoli and Isles. I had a, re- a reoccurring role in that as an yeah. undercover cop, which was cool. Yeah. Um, and then I worked with my sister on Grace and Frankie, which she was directing, and I was on that. That was cool. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, and I just did a short uh, for, uh, oh, my God, I'm forgetting Jamie's name. She's going to kill me. She's a great uh, writer-director. Uh, I'm forgetting her name. Ah, I'm blanking. That's Anyways, okay. <laughs> it's called Me Too Nice. Uh, it's ridiculous. Oh, but, it's but, short. but you know, the coolest thing was Return to Green Acres because your, <laughs> your, your, your dad said Eddie Albert fucking hated him. You know, like they did not get along. Eddie Albert was like bitchy. Well, Eddie Albert was sleeping the entire time on set. <laughs> also, I remember. <laughs> the town asleep. Yeah. My dad was, you know, that was like my dad's last thing he directed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was so cool, though. I remember the very first shot all the kids are supposed to be sad and it was my first time working with my dad on set and the camera's panning past all of us we're all supposed to be brooding and kind of sad and I just have this huge smile on my face and I hear cut 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 and he goes John I was like yeah and he goes what the hell are you smiling at <laughs> I was like ah uh, I'm just excited to be working with you he's oh, like okay perfect. this is smile Perfect. Yeah, so. I, I've got to know because yeah. like William Asher is like all of his family all knew each other and hung out and his wife still liked him and everything. Did you get a chance to meet Elizabeth Montgomery? Of course, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. She was uh, amazing. Super sweet. Uh, she did the most incredible Christmas you've ever seen in your life. Her Christmases were, I mean, insane. insane. I've never seen anything like it. She put on Christmas, and now Rebecca, I think the torch has been handed to Rebecca. Yeah. Rebecca is very uh, out of control, generous, mm-hmm. so sweet. I mean, by the way, look up Rebecca Asher. You guys talk about a good interview. That's, I should set that up for you guys. You would be, uh, that's someone you want to research. Absolutely. For sure, for sure. And, and you know, she, she's got a boyfriend, so I wouldn't probably do that. But you ought to consider looking up Erin Murphy, who played Tabitha. She's cute. Aaron Murphy. I know Aaron Murphy very well. Yeah. Uh, if, if I was yeah, you, I'd, be, I'd be there with a bunch of roses. Because her, <laughs> <laughs> she definitely is cute. Wow. Yeah, she's more like a sister now, but yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. So, so as we go here, well, i got to remind you of my favorite part of the interview when we were at the Universal Hilton. Do you remember when we were talking and all of a sudden we got bombed or photobombed by Angeline? We did? Yeah, like yeah. we were talking and Angeline noticed that we were interviewing you and you know she's always trying to get in the press with her. She kept like prancing back and forth in front behind you and you were like, hey there. <laughs> it was fun. You had to be there. You had to be there. <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah. I What? Okay. I don't know what happened. I would have been on a billboard next to a pink Corvette. <laughs> it would have been all over. It, it's Hollywood. Crazy stuff happens. But I'm glad you're still working. And and please, please, please pursue this. I know you got all this other stuff going, but keep pushing on this weird science thing. That would be so fun. It would be fun. Uh, and, and we are. We're going to push. We just got to, you know, we got to figure it out. I mean, people are hungry for content, so we're happy to provide it. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, I want to thank you, John, so much for spending some time with us. I, I, I know that you're you're busy. You're getting ready to fly out to Hawaii, but uh, thank you for spending the time with us. And uh, keep in touch. We'd love to have you back on to promote any any new projects that you have coming out in the future. I will keep in touch. Yeah, just keep bugging me with text and stuff. And I don't mean bugging me, but just keep hitting me up. Uh, Absolutely. Because that's that's the best way to get my attention. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm like, huh? <laughs> and my brain is going a million miles a second. And I, and I apologize for not being there last week to, to anybody out there that cares uh, and to you guys. Um, and thank you so much for always uh, just being being a constant in my life. You guys have always been positive, and that's, uh, I can't thank you enough for that. Thank well, you. you're, you're a popular guy. I'm going to check. To, to check the ratings tonight, but I know the show you were supposed to be on, there was a whole lot of people waiting to hear you that night. So you definitely got a fan base. Nice! Hello, everybody! <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you again, John. Have a wonderful weekend. Have a happy Father's Day, and please have a safe flight tomorrow. Thank you, I will, and you do the same. Absolutely. Have a great rest of your weekend. All right, you too, guys. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.